Good evening. Welcome to episode three of Medusa's Tangle. I'm Numar Six Star, and uh, I'm here to share the information that I have gathered in my studies over the last eight years since the day of my awakening. Today is a very special day um, because it's the anniversary of my awakening. Today is June 12th, 2017. I awakened on June 12th, 2009. Um, Life hasn't been the same since. From the moment I awakened, my number one interest has been in figuring out the truth of reality. Uh, Because the reality that I thought was reality before I awakened wasn't. So I've spent quite a lot of time uh, studying literature on the subject and engaging in pretty much every um, sort of spiritual, metaphysical activity that I could um, since that time. One of the things that um, is a little bit of a different habit, I I was a person who always prayed. I just felt weird if I didn't pray. Um, But I pray a little bit differently now, and um, I'm just going to go ahead and start this with a prayer. And I'm just uh, going to say, uh, Dear Lord, thank you for... uh, Thank you for awakening me, Um, and thank you uh, for letting me hear you and letting me hear the guidance um, that you would like to have delivered to other people. Thank you for filling me with the courage to answer the call. Uh, Thank you for helping what I'm doing right here and now be the best thing that I can do with the right here and now. Um, So be it, so it is. Amen. Uh, So I've I've had a couple friends take a look at the first couple of episodes, and uh, one of the comments that I got was that I skip around a lot. Now there's a reason for that. Um, As I had mentioned in earlier episodes, I am um, a person whose professional background is very orderly. I'm a scientist and I'm a lawyer. I'm used to doing things in an orderly manner. However, for this endeavor, I received a dream. And I knew that this dream, when I started all this, I knew this dream was related. But in this dream, I was in the library at University of Virginia, one of the libraries there. Um, I went to school there. And uh, I was looking for my notes. I had to give a lecture, and I was looking for my notes that were in a notebook. And they were on a shelf in the library in the basement. Well, those shelves had been moved. And I was running up and down the stairs trying to find the shelf with my notebook. I could not find it. And the driver who was to take me to the lecture came and said, you have to leave now. So I got in the car. And I was trying to write an outline really quick before I had to go give this lecture. And the driver handed me a Coke and basically was like, you don't need an outline. And I'm like, "Mm, okay. (laughs) So I was taken to this other little library that I like there a lot. I don't know if it's still there, but it was a little quiet library that I liked to use when I was there um, for a couple years as an undergrad. And um, I did a lecture without notes. And one of the things that I have learned is my dreams instruct me. Um, And dreams are a mechanism through which you interact with the divine because you're in your subconscious. So when you're in your subconscious state, you're in real reality. That's, That's the divine, that's your higher self in your true state. And what happens when you're in earth incarnations is 
the communication from the divine comes through symbol. So it comes in symbol, it comes in signs, and it comes in dreams. But it is very uncommon that you're just given a message. Now, occasionally that does happen. Um, for example, I've had dreams. The, the messages have come through dreams, but they've been very explicit. If there's a crystal that the divine wants me to have, sometimes I'll just dream the word. I'll just see the word tourmaline, black tourmaline. I'm like, okay, well, I guess I better buy some. Um, but a lot of times the communication is through signs and symbols. And um, I was very recently instructed as to why that is, and it's so obvious I should have guessed it, but um, basically this reader that I went to said, look, they know that you want details. They know that that's what you want. But they're saying, what would be the point? What's the point? Where's the fun in it? You pretty much come to Earth to um, live in this kind of like 3D video game where reality is hidden from you and you have to find it. Like for me, that's the name of the game is it's not about killing the dungeon lord. It's about what is the truth? What is the real reality? And uh, the divine has the funnest ways of just messing around with you. One of the ways that the divine has interacted with me that I find to be completely hilarious is with um, fortunes from fortune cookies. So um, I'll just find them just laying around. I mean, and not on a night when we've had Chinese food. Um, they'll just be some weird place. And I'm like, all right, well, let me see what this is all about. And it's always something interesting. Now tonight, we had Chinese, and uh, the divine did send me a message in my fortune cookie. I'll get it. And here it is. Truth is what stands the test of experience. And that's what I'm all about. I'll show it to you. Hopefully you can see this. Anyway, I don't know if I held that up there long enough. But uh, I was just like, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, so what, what truth has withstood the test of my experience over the last eight years? A very sort of explicit understanding came to me in the last couple of days. And you know, I was very aware that, you know, this, this was an important day coming up. This anniversary means a lot to me. It matters to me. Um, this is what I believe my purpose is. Um, you know, speaking of prayer, I always now, since I've awakened always before I take a meal, um, I always, or after the first few bites, you know, sometimes you have to eat a little first, but um, I always uh, give thanks. And um, it pretty much always starts the same way with please bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies. And then I add this, and the fulfillment of our soul purposes. So that's what's new, the fulfillment of my soul purpose. And I do think that um, in doing this, I'm living uh, an important part of my soul purpose, um, and that is disseminating the information that I've gathered um, over almost the last decade now. It's been a pretty long time. So, as I was saying, back to this weekend, and yes, I just skipped around again, sorry. Um, back to this weekend. I got a pretty harsh understanding. It was really pretty harsh. But this is how it came out. We've been lied to. All of us. We've been lied to. From the time we were little. What we've been told has been a lie. Now, 
I don't think there was, in most cases, um, any ill intent. We were just told what our parents were told. So when did the lies start being told and who told them and why did they tell them? And I discussed this today with uh, my hypnotherapist and um, we both very readily came to the same place in, in our understanding. We realized that we had really just kind of boiled it down to the same thing. And it's the church. I mean, the church, it's well known at this point that the church omitted um, all the information about reincarnation from its text. It was known at the time and a conscious choice was made to remove it. Um, and that was for purposes of control. So, and we both got to the same place in our understanding with it. That's, that's what the lies have been about. They've been about control. Now, I don't think that the people who perpetuated the lies that um, have come from the church um, were doing so for the sake of control. I don't think that, that that's what everyone was after. I do think that in the early days of the church, that is what they were after. I think that all of society was at a much cruder level of understanding. And Dolores Cannon, who is one of the authors I've discussed with you uh, in earlier episodes, Dolores Cannon puts it very well, you do not feed a baby steak dinner. And I think the thought that she espouses is that humankind has come along at the pace that was appropriate for it, for its understanding, for the understanding of humans. Humans haven't been, her, I think her, what I gather of her philosophy is that humans weren't ready for this understanding until now. We've been through a lot from the time that Jesus was here until now and the Bible was written. Um, we've been through quite a lot. Um, so I guess she was thinking that this is happening now in divine right time because we're ready for it. And what I mean by this is the great awakening. This is the time of the great awakening. Um, so you know, maybe it's not the best thing to, to, well, but it's true. I mean, I'm like, is it really fair to cast it as lying? But lies were told, and they were told um, to control. And as uh, Gina pointed out, my hypnotherapist pointed out, she was like, some control was needed um, because people were engaging in behaviors that were um, really dangerous, like syphilis was out of control. So um, there were these societal scourges, these health scourges, that moral control helped to contain. So there were, there were beneficial reasons for doing it. Uh, nonetheless, we're at a time now in which I think the real truth is becoming known to us. And what's interesting to me is when you look at the overall landscape of uh, the metaphysical development now, the state of metaphysical knowledge, it really does seem to be coming back full circle to ancient knowledge. and. Now it's referred to as the rise of the divine feminine. The basic <clears throat> theory is that, um, and I was told this too in my recent readings, is that I personally came here with uh, one of my goals being to balance my male and female energy. Um, and I think I've talked a little bit about this before. Um, male energy is the equated with the sun, female energy is equated with the moon. Um, when you look at the yin and yang, yang sim symbol, the female energy is the black energy and the white energy is the male energy and it's the energy of action and doing. 
and um, female energy is uh, the energy of intuition and receiving. Male energy is the energy of giving. Um, but when out of balance, um, giving becomes forcing. And receiving, the female energy of receiving, becomes the energy of submission. So it goes from giving and receiving, which is balanced and loving, to force and submission. Um, which is what's happened in our society. It's happened on the earth. It still happens in parts of the earth. It still happens in a lot of people's relationships. Um, <clears throat> so part of what I'm doing personally is trying to balance that um, so that it's of the loving variety um, and not the out of balance variety. Um, but what is happening overall, the sort of overall arc of movement, um, it, it's interesting. It's almost as though to move forward, there's a reaching back to the time of the Divine Feminine when there were goddesses. And um, it's apparently time for the rise of goddess energy. Um, in respect of that, um, I wear this scarab, um, which is associated with Hakati, um, who is the goddess of the three-way crossroads. Um, and that's where the name of this series comes from. Medusa is one of the faces of Hakati. And if you are a daughter of Hakati, uh, she will first make herself known to you um, with the visage of Medusa. And that was how I first met Hakati on a shamanic journey. I saw her in the guise of Medusa. So uh, somehow in this work that I'm doing, uh, I'm bringing her energy back, um, as are many of uh, the metaphysicians of this day and age. So one of the really major understandings that I've come to really recently, as in the last few days, it finally dawned on me, um, is that we're at a point in which when you incorporate Christ consciousness, and I know this seems uh, as though it strays from the reach back for the goddess energy, but it's, it's not, it's a balancing, it's not, it's, it all needs to be included. Um, but when you incorporate the Christ consciousness, what that ultimately results in is that you then have your own direct connection with the divine and you don't have to go through Jesus to get there. And um, as I mentioned to you before, I channel Jesus and he is, I'm seeing him now, and he's clapping and whooping it up because he's like, you finally got it. I'm like, all right. So it took me a while. Um, but I realized, here's, it, it came to me, this understanding came to me through my songwriting process. So what happens is like, I'll be like strolling around when my mind is like at rest um, and I'm not thinking about something, a song will come in. And um, it's just sort of like zipped in there. And I'm like, yeah, okay. It's like a present from the other side. And then um, sometimes I don't get, most of the time I don't get the whole song. And then I have to write part of it to finish it. So I might get the chorus and I might get a verse, but I might need to have another couple verses. Um, or I might just get a melody. And then I'll have to write lyrics all the way to go with the melody. So... Um, I can tell when it's my human mind and when there's this otherworldly something that's like pouring songs into me. And um, I realized 
So I, I, and I also channel Jesus. And then I realized, I thought, well, you know, when I'm interacting with Jesus, it's not the same thing as some of this other stuff I get. And I'm like, well, where is that coming from? Is that my higher self? What is that? And uh, then finally this weekend, I don't know why it is. It, well, I've, I've got this anniversary, so that's probably why I finally got it. But I finally realized that that's what this is about. This is about us individually having our own connection with the divine. We do not need a priest. You know, I realize this is a sad thing, but when I first started to channel Jesus, I just kind of thought, I didn't believe it. First of all, that's just such a weird thing. Because you know, that's another thing. We're not raised with that. We are not raised to have our own sort of personal dialogue with Jesus. People think you're nuts if you do that. But we're not raised for it. Well, it's reality. We're here for that. That's our truth is that we're truly spiritual beings and there's no reason why we shouldn't have a dialogue with Jesus. Just because he's not visible here, he's here. You just can't see him. It's like music. Music is in the room. You know, when you're playing music, you just can't see it. But it's there. I know you hear it. I hear Jesus. Um, So, and sometimes I can see him in my mind's eye too. Um, So... It's the time of establishing our own direct connection. That's what happens when you take in the Christ consciousness, when you assume it into yourself. And the reason that I guess I dialed in on it is I had this overwhelming feeling of knowing. And doing these videos, it's, it's an effort. I mean, it is an effort. It's not in my natural state of being to want people to look at me. I'm not about it. I don't want attention like that. And especially attention for this kind of stuff. It's weird. So, But I'm getting it. You know, I'm doing it. Why am I doing it? Because I feel, I feel. It's a knowing and it's a feeling that's very powerful. That this is what I should do. And within myself, I feel as though I am falling short and not, fulfilling a promise or an obligation or a mission, but I feel as though it's time to do it and I must do it. I am called to do it. That's what it feels like. And what that is, is the divine communicating with me directly. Um, Another way that the divine communicates with you. um, Now it's symbolic, but what I mean by directly is you don't have to go through a preacher to get it. Um, You don't have to go to church and sit there and have somebody tell you what this or that means. You can have your own understanding, your own interaction with the world and with the divine. Here's an example. Uh, A few days ago, out on the, there's a three-way crossroads in front of my house. That is no accident that I am a daughter of Hakati and that right outside my front door is a three-way crossroads. So at this crossroads, in the middle of the day, on a clear street, stood a vulture. And it, there was nothing to eat. There was no carcass, no nothing. It was just walking circles, just there. And it was me and the vulture for quite some time. And... I thought, all right, I need to go look up Vulture. I'm to understand what this message is. And uh, Vulture stands for purification, for death, and for rebirth. So it's about rebirth. A few days before I saw that Vulture, I was on my walk. And I picked up a perfect black feather this big. After I saw the vulture, I was on my walk and I picked up another feather this big. They look like vulture feathers to me. They were black. The fullness, the completion, 
symbolized by the long mature feather, rebirth symbolized by the short baby feather. So something special is happening. It's a shift time. Uh, what I've also noticed in conjunction with these signs, um, I have noticed I'm, I'm not sleeping as much. So for the last um, six weeks maybe, um, my sleep patterns have changed significantly. And I'm now down to about five hours a night, which is quite a bit less than I'm used to. And uh, the last time I had a shift like this was when I was in a state of very elevated energy. Um, and I was actually able to tune in to the field. And um, I could hear the field of consciousness that connects us all. Um, I was just very tuned into it. And I was receiving a lot of message. And the message would come to me um, written very plainly, like uh, as though it were written on a bumper sticker, which is why I created the blog Good Bumper Sticker, um, because that's one of the ways that the divine communicates with me is the divine sends me messages on basically bumper stickers. So I get that sometimes. Um, so the truth is, that it is now the time for us to all, um, if, if you're so inclined, you know, if you're not, that's cool too. Everybody comes along at their own pace, but um, it's time for us to connect with the divine, ourselves, directly. Jesus is there if you want him, but he's saying, if you have taken me in, if you have taken in his energy and his consciousness, then that's the whole point of his energy and consciousness is direct connection with the divine. So I think it's a pretty special time. Um, now, I think that's really the main gist of what I wanted to say tonight. I thought it was going to take me a long time. It didn't take that long. Um, and what I did was sort of sidetrack from what my original lesson had been um, for tonight. Um, or, you know, not so much lesson as in more just like sharing some more information about what our journey is really like. Because um, by this point, I've got to think that anybody who has listened this long knows that um, God is not a guy in the sky um, waiting to judge you for being naughty. Um, God is just a pure love energy. That's what God is. That's all God has to give is love. Um, and just of the absolute purest variety. Um, the person who will judge you when you cross back over will be yourself. There is no one else who will judge you. Judgment of others is not a thing known in the world of spirit. That's an invention of the earth. Um, and it's an invention of the earth because we have come here to the school of duality, where we learn um, by the experiencing of opposites. So we learn about love by experiencing hate which is why this is the soul school of the brave. Um, only the bravest threads of energy are able to tolerate this particular dimension and this particular soul school. So pat yourself on the back. Um, so with that all being said, uh, I think it might be a good time to segue over to a continuation of um, the information that fascinated me most, which is what really happens when you die. And um, in earlier episodes, we've talked about the tunnel and the crossing over or the getting kicked back if it's not your time or you haven't finished your soul mission. And uh, one of the points that I wanted to make sure I brought up there is <clears throat> when you come to earth 
typically what I've read is that you plan roughly three to five exit points where you can check out and go home if you're done. So, and if, I guess if you get to your last exit point and you haven't finished everything, then you've just bought yourself another life. So nobody's going to make you come back, but you're going to want to come back. Souls um, try to get into the Earth School because you get the fastest degree of perfection here because it's so tough. Um, you learn really fast here, much faster than other soul schools is what I've read. Um, but basically the idea is that what we seek is a state of perfect love. And when we can achieve that state of perfect love, then we can go back home to Source. We can merge again with Source and um, become part of that energy instead of the sort of individual strand of consciousness that we, each of us, live. Even though on the other side we can feel our connectedness, there's still, I mean, we feel like individuals here. We understand what individual experience is. Um, we understand what it is to feel separate from source. And it's that separation that is the root cause of um, what pains us all. So, uh, last week, um, I, or in the last episode, I discussed um, going back and meeting with your elder council um, to review your progress with your soul lessons um, and your, your karmic balancing um, when you go back. Now, there's another key point, and this is why I want to do another Life Between Life regression. There's another key point in which you meet with your elder council, and that's before you come. And when you come back to Earth, um, you have what's called a life, <clears throat> a life planning session. And <clears throat> in this session, um, you figure out, well, what elements do you want to work on in your lifetime? Um, <clears throat> you know, is there a particular karma you need to balance? For example, um, did you have a lifetime in which you were just very submissive and <clears throat> you got pushed around a lot and now you need a lifetime of being the one who does the pushing so that you can understand that thread of energy from both ends of the spectrum. Um, and that's a real simplification, but that that's, um, gets you the gist of, of the types of things that go into your planning. Um, you also um, may have things you want to work out in your relationships with some of your soulmates. Um, there's typically the people who are close to you in your life are typically people that are in your soul group or in an affiliated soul group. And um, these are folks that you do your learning with. And uh, sometimes there may be experiences that you want to have. Um, for example, in my own experience, um, there was a soul in a past life whom I had rejected. And, um, you know, it was a romantic relationship. Uh, he did not believe that um, that was real. He, he, he thought surely that wasn't meant. So in this lifetime, I had to do it again. And I meant it. Uh, and it was, I'm hoping he got it this time. Uh, God bless him, but a minute. <laughs> so I, he, I don't know how many times it's going to take him, and I don't know how many times I'm going to be willing to come back and help him out on that score. But there are certain behaviors that, you know, it's like, you know, when you do that kind of thing, bye. <laughs> it's pretty simple. Uh, so that's an example of um, the type of thing that you come back here to do. Now, uh, the thing that's really, that makes it all extremely interesting, and it's the thing that makes me crazy, is uh, there's a thing called the veil of forgetting. So 
you meet with your elder council, you set up your plan of the learning you want to do so that you can learn about every aspect of love from good to bad, top to bottom. That's ultimately what every lesson is about is love. And so you set your plan up, you pick all your people and the way that you pick your people is in your life review meeting for really key players, what will happen is these souls that are going to be key at some point in your incarnation will come before you in your life planning session and you will see what they're going to look like. So that, or there will be some kind of a sign that you are shown in your life planning session. So you know when you meet people and you know right away that you're going to be friends with them, like within 20 minutes you're just like, oh, I'm, I'm going to be, this is going to be my friend. Um, or typically any kind of a significant romantic relationship, any of those, you met them in your life planning session. You knew that was coming. Those are a big deal. And they are, those are typically always going to be planned because that's where you really get major learning is in those close relationships. So you're going to have pre-chosen, pre-selected who those are going to be with. And, um, there are, the, the way that I understand the life journey is most of it is free will choice. But there are certain uh, points in the script or uh, there are certain points on the journey that are scripted is a better way to put it. So most of the journey is designed for you to exercise your free will and to grow as you will through the exercise of your free will. And there is a principle of non-interference. A lot of the stuff that they um, used in Star Trek, like the principle of non-interference, actually um, Gene Roddenberry was um, visited a circle. He was a regular member of a circle with a lady who was a psychic. That was channeled. So she channeled that from the other side. There are principles in Star Trek that definitely came from the other side. And... Um, the principle of non-interference with free will is one of them. However, there are junctures that are critical um, because they're important um, relationships, soul relationships that are meant to happen in a particular incarnation. So um, the divine will work the energy to um, ensure that those key junctures are possible that they happen and um, that you can take the journey that you meant to take with whatever soulmate at whatever important point. But a lot of it is, um, a lot of the trip is actually free will choice. Um, so you will have known, have met on the other side. You'll have seen the faces of the people who are important to you. Um, and another thing is you do choose your parents. You choose your family. You're typically given three choices and you pick the one. You're allowed to just choose which one you think will suit you best. Um, so those and those families are selected um, because they offer the circumstances that will help you with the particular growth you want. Additionally, sometimes what you're doing is you're healing um, familial karma. So a particular genetic line may have a long-standing karma and you may be selected or you may volunteer a lifetime to go and heal that karma. Um, and let me try to think of what would be a good example of um, I don't know, maybe you are in a family line where, um, let's say that there's a long family history of um, women who betray um, their, their husbands. And um, you may be the daughter who was born into that family who is always true. And you're living a lifetime of, um, of being faithful 
may be what is needed to heal a long line of karma in a family. Um, so I have heard of that happening as well. So I want to go back and do another life between life regression because I would like to go to my life planning session. Now I'm probably going to get the same treatment that I got when I went to see the um, elder council when they pretty much didn't tell me anything. But I still want to go and at least see. Um, so I'll let you know. I'll be getting that done at some point. Um, I also wanted to tell you about, oh, so earlier in this evening's rambling talk, sorry, it is like extra rambly today, um, <clears throat> I had mentioned that the divine interacts with us through dream, symbol, and sign. So, um, what did I want to tell you about the dream? Oh, what I wanted to tell you about dream was something that Edgar Casey said that I find to be truer and truer. But he said, if you want to know your future, pay attention to your dreams. So uh, that I do find to be true, that most of the clairvoyant experience that I have comes through dreams. And I do dream of things that will come true um, sometimes the next day, but sometimes years later. Um, one example of that is a song that I wrote, and it's, it's a sad example, but it's one of the long-term clairvoyant episodes I had, but I woke up one day with a song in my head, and um, it was about a convenience store. <laughs> it was a lyric and a melody about a convenience store, and I'm like, <laughs> why would I get a song about a convenience store? And uh, I thought that it was one of these kind of dark songs about somebody... Um, shooting up a convenience store, you know, like a serial killing, you know, like we seem to have everywhere now. And uh, what I realized one day, I was sitting in the courthouse getting ready to testify for my friend who had become addicted to um, heroin and had robbed convenience stores. And that's what it was about. And it was years before it happened. And it was um, the moment that I was sitting there listening to the case that was being presented and I was just like that's what that's what the song came for was for this so um another set of uh, I I'm want to share with you uh, one story about um symbol that came this weekend and it was dragonfly symbol and um, how did it start? It started with the dragonfly in front of my windshield looking at me. You know how they like to do that? How they'll hover like right in front of you and look at you? Well, when that's happening, pay attention because the universe wants you to note dragonfly. Dragonfly energy is here. So what is dragonfly symbol? Well, I didn't look it up right away and I didn't even think about it honestly. But then I went to spend the night with a friend and she pulled out sheets that had dragonflies. And I was like, oh, I just, I just saw this dragonfly. I saw a dragonfly in my car or in front of my car. And then we went to lunch the next day and the lady at the next table over had a giant dragonfly necklace. And I'm like, all right, I definitely need to look this up. And my friend had just bought a dragonfly purse at um, the thrift store and I'm like and she gave it to me so I'm like all right so I will share with you um, what I looked up about dragonfly so um, I have to say I usually like to use this book let me show you this one and I'm not sure that I have shown you this book before but it's Animal Speak by Ted Andrews and normally, I think this one's great, but in this circumstance, I'm not um, feeling it on the dragonfly. And that's a very important thing with anything you read or you're trying to interpret is to check in with your feelings. And if it feels right, awesome. But if it doesn't, keep looking because these symbols have many different messages. 
Um, so, and you've got to figure out, well, which one of these is it? And in this case, I had looked up um, Dragonfly, and uh, what I found is, where is it? Here we go. Dragonflies <clears throat> flap their wings 30 times a minute versus the 600 times a minute that a mosquito has to flap its wings to stay in flight. Um, dragonflies also move in all six directions, so they are efficient. And what was very interesting is um, right before I went home or went to my friend's house and she pulled out these dragonfly sheets, the waitress at the restaurant where we'd gone at the diner had had a whole discussion with us about efficiency and how she did her work. And then I came home, saw the dragonfly symbol, looked it up, and I'm like, oh, it's about efficiency. That's interesting. Um, and it's also about, it's interesting, the Welsh um, used to call um, dragonflies, what was that? Can I read my writing? Somebody's servant. I don't think that looks very nice either. But um, they said that one of the things, oh, the snake servant. So the Welsh would call dragonflies the snake servant because they stitched up wounds. And um, a theme for me has been a wounded healer. That's what this crystal, the green crystal, this green crystal here, the peridot, it's the crystal for the wounded healer. And um, I thought, okay, this looks like some kind of a shift message, stitching up wounds. Um, so also um, dragonflies um, also are representative of metamorphosis, of change, and of the kind of change that comes with maturity. Um, and these are changes that have come to me, you know, I've been around. Um, so they're coming to me after a lot of life experience that I'm learning these really vastly different ways of looking at the world. So the main message that came to me this weekend that was important to impart is this. Every single person on earth, every single person on earth had a life planning session before they came here. All of us have a divine purpose. Every single one of us is a divine being of light. Every single one of us. There's not one who's any greater or any lesser. We are all divine beings of light. Every one of us has an important soul purpose to carry out in this lifetime. This is not anything they tell you when you're a little kid. They don't tell you that. But that's what it's all about. And then we have this veil of forgetting that's put over us. So you agree to do this when you come to Earth. You agree to come and completely forget that you are a divine being of light. And you think you're just a lowly slob. So we all just think that we're ignorant, lowly slobs, that we, or either that or, you know, you're like a narcissistic, like, scary person. Um, but most of us um, feel very challenged. We feel, you know, afraid. You know, I don't need to tell you. You live it. Uh, but we don't know that. We don't know that we're actually divine beings and that we have a mission that um, was discussed with these, you know, really evolved elders and um, that we've come here for a divine purpose. No one tells you that, but it's what the real truth is. And it's time for us all to awaken to it. So um, that, I guess, is tonight's main lesson is that every single person is a divine being with a divine mission. And I don't care how hard their life is. Um, in fact, they probably have, they probably have, who knows, 
those could be some of the most developed beings. Um, one thing I have read is that the most spiritually developed beings are not going to be holding public office and you are not going to ever see their face on People magazine. Um, they're going to have quiet lives somewhere. <laughs> so, uh, all right, now I'm at that point where I do wish I had an outline because I'm kind of thrashing around wondering, is there anything else I should share? Uh, hmm. I don't think so. I didn't bring any crystals tonight. I did share with you, though, about the um, peridot. And I do think what I'm going to do is add a little clip on um, to the end or the beginning somewhere and show you the crystals that I sleep with. So I have a group of crystals that have come to me that I knew, just I had a knowing, that they were to be put under my pillow. So I sleep with a crystal grid under my pillow every night. And these pillows are, or these crystals, are to improve my connection with the divine and my clairvoyant activities and also to um, keep negative energy um, from my space. And what I do is I um, get a, a hypnotherapy. I have a hypnotherapy tape that I listen to, or not tape, but a CD that I listen to. And um, what I do is picture myself in a sphere of um, purple light. And um, I got this from Doreen Virtue. It's very good. It was from one of her weekly card readings that she suggested this. But I picture myself in a sphere of purple light. And the energy that comes in, if it's anything other than love energy, then when it comes into my sphere, it's transformed into love energy. Um, or better yet, if um, it shouldn't be coming into my sphere at all, it bounces off. So any kind of negative energy, I direct my subconscious that that energy will be repelled, it will bounce off, and it will be converted to love energy and returned to its source. And energy, any energy within my sphere that is anything other than love energy will be converted to love energy. Um, because ultimately, to me, if what you want to do is return to the source, um, return home, that's our ultimate home, then the way you get there is to get yourself into the purest state of love that you can. And um, that seems like a good way to close this episode which is a special episode to me, rambly though it may have been, but um, today's my eighth anniversary. I've been awake for eight years. So uh, thank you for listening. And um, I don't know, we'll see what, what, oh, I do have something special for probably, the, maybe not the next time, but coming up, uh, I'm gonna share with you um, a pathway to world peace because we are going to be experiencing world peace in this lifetime. It's time for it. And uh, I've had much confirmation on this. So that's the teaser. Uh, so we'll be coming back to that. All right. Well, blessings to you and thank you so much for listening. <laughs>